varied agroclimatic conditions are suitable for diverse range of fruits, vegetables, spices, plantation crops, medicinal and aromatic plants. So the challenge number one here is that is a catch 22 situation. It has extremely wide portfolio but low quantities. Number two, 80 percent of the population is dependent on agriculture and allied sectors for the livelihood. Yet the area under collection is only around 10 percent of the total land area. So the challenge number two here is the low productivity, which should our farmers decide to address by shifting their focus to only high yielding, commercially beneficial crops, and our state will lose its wide portfolio, its rare indigenous crops and plants. Three, the opening up of the agriculture sector and the understanding of economics is also pushing farmers so as the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides the easier way out. So challenge number three here is that how do we preserve one of our core strengths, that of natural farming? So number five, or number four, sorry, the existence of middlemen, which to the farmers is again an immediate convenience, but a long term forfeit. So here the challenge number four is, how do we strengthen the rural communities economically? So it is these challenges that in one form or the other, that the various stakeholders have addressed. And unfortunately for us, we have in our midst today in the panel, some of the very good stakeholders who have directly led the way, tackle these issues and will share with us some lessons learned. So uh, we will begin our decision today first with the opening remarks from none other than our Minister of Agriculture, uh, Dr. M. Abri Lindovna. Please uh, start with your opening remarks on your side. Very, very good afternoon, one and all. I am very honored to stand before you today as we gather here to discuss a topic of paramount importance, building agri-value chains in remote locations, lessons from Meghalaya. The forum will provide us with a unique opportunity to share the invaluable experiences and insights gained from our endeavors in the agriculture sector, particularly in the breathtaking state of Meghalaya. The rugged and picturesque terrain of Meghalaya, nestled in the northeastern region of India, offers a diverse agro-climatic canvas. From the Garo Hills to the Khasi and Jaiti Hills, our state's varied topography has blessed us with a wealth of agricultural potential. The richness, this richness is evident in the wide array of crops that flourish in our so soil, from mandarin oranges to lakadong turmeric, each bearing its own unique signature. Yet, in, despite this natural bounty, we face a set of challenges that require concerted efforts to overcome. Our farmers, who form the backbone of our economy, often operate on small-scale holdings, limiting their ability to compete on a larger stage. Access to credit mean, remains a hurdle, and the prevalence of middlemen in our agriculture market chain poses its own set of challenges. However, I stand here on behalf of the government of Meghalaya and the Honorable Chief Minister, who could not be here to share his valuable inputs here this afternoon, to share with you the vision and approach that the government of Meghalaya has adopted to address these issues. We firmly believe in a community-based, bottom-up approach, one that empowers our farmers and ensures they receive the support they need. Through targeted missions focused on high-value commercial crops, we are striving to bring about a transformation in the lives of our farming communities. 
The cornerstone of our strategy lies in formal collectivization. By aggregating the efforts of our dedicated farmers, we aim to harness the power of economies of scale, ensuring fair pricing and access to credit. Our efforts have led to the establishment of numerous collectives, from integrated value chain societies to organic farmers, producers, organizations, each playing a pivotal role in this journey. Post-Harvard storage infrastructure is equally crucial in our mission. With the establishment of warehouses, cold storage units, and more, we are extending the shelf life of our produce, preventing distressed sales, enabling, and enabling bulk trade and processing. This infrastructure is a testimony to our commitment to providing our farmers with the tools they need to thrive. Value addition is another critical aspect of our strategy. By investing in processing units, we are not only enhancing the shelf life of perishable goods, but also opening up new markets for our farmers. From turmeric to ginger, we are taking significant strides in adding value to our produce, ensuring that our farmers receive the remuneration they rightly deserve. In closing, I would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed speakers and participants for being a part of this knowledge session. I am confident that the lessons we share today will not only benefit Meghalaya, but also serve as a source of inspiration for agricultural development across this nation. Kublai, Mithila, Jaihin. For your inspiring words, and uh, we do hope that yeah, this session that we're going to have today is going to be a very lively session. And uh, moreover, we are looking forward to a very good interaction from the audience. So we will begin with our discussion. So our first panelist is our very own dynamic secretary of government of Megalia. Department of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, and Managing Director of Meghana State Agricultural Marketing Board Organization, Srimati Isawanda Lalu, who will share with us the government of Meghalaya's approach towards building agri value chains in the state. So, just a short introductory about Madam Isawanda. Uh, she's got about 10 years of experience in government of Meghalaya. And her core experience is administration. She has served as SGO civil and Amla from 2015 to 2017. She was a deputy commissioner of South West Cast Hills in 2017 up to 2020. And again, the deputy commissioner of East Cast Hills from 2020 to 2023. And now she's also serving as the director of sports and secretary to the agriculture department and farmers' welfare. She's an MA in English and she's on IS of the batch 2013. So, over to you, ma'am. Who is yours? Thank you to our moderator, Bhav Makbul, our respected minister in charge of agriculture and farmers welfare, government of Meghalaya, all esteemed panelists, um, IFAD country head, uh, Mr. Demirai, who is in our midst, as well as all my friends from Meghalaya, uh, Father Sami. Uh, Kong Tiriti Sayo, who is a Padma Shri awardee, uh, Ba Agassiz Suting, who is the APD of LAMP, and Father Sunny Joseph, who is uh, with us as well, and all uh, dear friends who are part of this esteemed audience. It gives me great pleasure to stand before you. I'd just like to give a short synopsis or summary of the context uh, that we are looking at when we talk about building agri value chains in remote locations of Meghalaya. Now, since Bhavam Bhul has mentioned that I was SDO civil and has served as DC in, in two districts, uh, you may ask how remote. So I want to tell you that uh, during my experience as collector, uh, some areas were so remote that when we had to conduct elections, uh, our officials had to trek on foot for almost seven to eight hours to get the machines to those places. They had to leave three days before the poll so that 
you know, there is no accident, there is no untoward incident, their cars don't break down, they can cross the bridge safely, their boat, nothing happens to their boat. And also, uh, not just in terms of uh, motorability by road, but also in terms of network connectivity. Network, there are a large number of villages which are still not connected by any form of mobile network. And I remember one incident where one of my polling officials would say that, Madam, in this village, I will not be able to send you the poll uh, result in time because I have to go around uh, 500 meters from the polling station. Then I have to climb a tree, and only from the tree I can get network. So these are the kinds of stories which, you know, working in the field, we encounter from time to time. So really, when we're talking about the agri scenario and how we want to build sustainable and robust value chains in this remote part of uh, the country and in all these locations where our farmers are there, uh, we have to think outside the box and we are happy that in the past five years and more through the leadership of our Honorable Chief Minister, our Minister of Agriculture, and through the partnership with a diverse range of stakeholders, right from, uh, you know, uh, right from uh, agencies like IFAD and uh, uh, government programs as well as state-funded um, schemes, and most importantly, the support we have received from the community and the enterprising nature of our entrepreneurs who have really withstood all hardships to get to where they are. This is something which has really, you know, worked uh, miracles for us. So, in the context of Meghalaya, you know, uh, 4.5 lakh households are involved in uh, farming, agri or allied activities, which constitutes almost 70 to 75 percent of the total population. This is a big number, and therefore, it means that when we, uh, you know, when we look at the way forward, agriculture really holds the key to uplifting people out of poverty, to you know, uh, help uh, people stand on their own two feet and for overall progress of the state at large. Uh, next. Next, please. Yeah. So this is the vision laid down by our government that is we want to double the farmers' incomes, but in a way that we sustain our unique ecology and biodiversity. Because uh, you know, we have, we have, uh, Lakadong turmeric. We keep talking about Lakadong turmeric, but we found that when we took this, uh, you know, when we took the seedling and we tried to plant it elsewhere, the, the, the quality is not the same. The curcumin content is far less. So it means that there is something in our soil, in our air, in the way that the, the crop is cultivated that uh, enables the endemicity of these crops, and hence we have to preserve. Uh, you know, our ecology and, uh, and uh, go forward in a sustainable manner. Our strengths have already been laid out by the speakers before me, including our Honourable Minister. Yes, we have diverse agroclimatic conditions and hence a huge range of horticultural crops are grown. Uh, conventionally, people practice only organic farming, so uh, you know we are poised to do well even uh, in, in, in the organic sector and rich crop diversity. The challenges which we are still encountering, but on which we are trying to make substantial interventions, you can see before you, and, and these have also been laid down. Small scales, <laughs> fractured land holdings. The land uh, tenure system is very different in Meghalaya, although we have community land. Each farmer will own, most of the farmers are small or marginal. Uh, limited uh, access to technology, to extension services, to the latest, you know, in, in, in uh, technical inputs. Uh, when it comes to even basic things like, you know, sorting and grading and uh, treatment of the seeds, harvest management that was, uh, you know, not being done in the right way and hence that further restricted the, the saleability of the farmers produce. No use of technology by way of, uh, you know, cold storage facilities is also very important and because of the remoteness of our locations, without this we also cannot go very far. Uh, another very important factor is the low access to credit because banks are not always willing to give loans. People are loan shy, not willing to go to the bank for loans, and hence they farmers frequently uh, fall under the mercy of middlemen who exploit them and you know who do things like bagan booking, which I think some of our other panelists will talk about, because our farmers need money at specific times of the year, and hence uh, you know they are they are exploited for this reason. Um, so therefore, what we want to do, and if you look at the second line, you will see high value, low volume. We know we can never compete in scale with the rest of the country 
for, for, for paddy, your food grains, but where we can capitalize is on our strengths, is our unique horticulture products, which you know have uniqueness, which have high value in the market, even if they are grown in low quantities. So just as an example, black turmeric, which has immense value in the, you know, in the, uh, in, in therapeutic, uh, has high therapeutic properties. It's presently sold at almost two to three thousand rupees per kilo in the market. And at the same time, wintergreen, which you can see, and I'm happy that one of our entrepreneurs had showcased uh, wintergreen today as well. Uh, wintergreen also has uh, huge demand and potential in the aromatherapy industry. Farmers are already cultivating this in low scales, and they already have a premium price in the market. Cocoa is also grown widely, but it's being explored. And hence, uh, the second point, the, the naturally organic practices, uh, you know, we can build on this, we can capitalize on this by ensuring that our farmers get the right kind of certification to be able to capture these markets. And lastly, uh, we need to pro promote, uh, you know, the GI tagging of our crops and build markets for endemic crops. We have already uh, tagged the Khasi Mandarin, um, the Lakadong turmeric in the process, Remy fiber and other kinds of horticulture crops uh, will also be done. So the story of overcoming the challenges is a long one and you know it is not the government of Meghalaya solely who has found out you know the magic solution it is through the efforts and the trial and errors and the continuous persistence of you know people like Kong Trinity uh, people like Father Sunny and Revi Star uh, from from Eastern Ribhoi FPC who have uh, you know uh, by sheer dint of their determination and dedication have uh, been able to uh, collectivize, bring farmers together and make them understand that there is a very high value for us if we come together. And some of these interventions you can see in front of you is that um, we were able to, uh, you know, provide better inputs to the farmers. Our farmers used bad quality seeds below, before, so naturally the yields were low. Uh, through in the Lakadong uh, mission, we introduced um, you know high quality seeds to them. Uh, storage facilities were, were were given to them. We got in touch with Spice Board, with um, Tamil Nadu University, and both from the lamb project as well as from the department training was given to the farmers on on good practices, on developing a good package of practices. So these are the things which really made the difference uh, in the long run. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was an issue when it comes to building a comprehensive database of farmers because I told you that since we have a different sort of land tenure system, we don't have the data of all the farmers before us. In order to implement any policy, in to implement any interventions, we need a repository of information. And hence, uh, through our NIC Meghalaya, we help develop a portal where all farmers can register, they can have a farmer's ID. And uh, we are in the process of developing an application where all their details can be aggregated and collated on a single platform. And this is really the use of tech and um, you know data management, which we can uh, capitalize on. Um, 1917 iTeams is, is an intervention which not only is a sort of call center for farmers, any farmer who needs to connect to buyers, needs information on, on pesticides, on uh, biofertilizers, on um, you know how to how to, uh, how to harvest his crops properly can call this helpline and at the same time we provide um, a mobility solution to farmers who are located far away from the market and they can just through a single phone call uh, get a pickup truck to come to the location and help to uh, and help to transport their produce and at the same time we have uh, established uh, tissue culture labs and set up various processing units and post-harvest infrastructure such as cold storages uh, to address some of these gaps. So the story we are talking about right now, the journey which we have gone through is really through, you know, forming clusters of farmers at the level of the, the village or the group of villages. This will address the problem of scale. And the next step is that we make sure that we have these collective marketing centers, which is looking, which is a nodal point, which can then procure the produce from a group of farmers at a fixed price and then do away with the impact of uh, middlemen. And at the same time, in order to increase the shelf life of the products, in order to add value to them, uh, the post-harvest infrastructure right at the cluster level has also been set up. Uh, so these are truly aimed at, you know, addressing all those issues which we talked about um, earlier. Um, 
agri markets have also been established in in all blocks of the district uh, since the access to markets like i informed you earlier is uh, very very poor and lastly we have also worked on uh, you know branding our produce giving it a, a good name giving it visibility giving it uh, something which is catchy so meglaya collectives uh, and 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 so many other homegrown brands have come up in the past couple of years which will help our farmers and our producers and our food processors to be able to market their their products so uh, through this overview i want to point out that you know these interventions have been made in a very holistic approach through the uh, through the uh, joint uh, efforts of uh, externally aided project projects like uh, the megalai access to livelihoods under ifad Uh, we have the MOBCD NER uh, program under the uh, ministry, uh, which is for promoting organic value chains. All of these uh, interventions have helped us uh, do away with the issues which we are facing of reduced yields, of uh, you know low areas uh, of production, of post-harvest losses, and of uh, reduced incomes. so i hope that through the course of uh, you know the panelists uh, talks you will be able to get a first hand information on what exactly they have done i think they will be able to inform you much better on you know the various on the journey that they have taken so far and i hope that it can become a starting point or a jumping board for other entrepreneurs and other farmers to pick up on and to really help us take uh, meghalaya to the next level so with these uh, introductory words i thank you once again and uh, uh, thank you So I'm back for those insights. So any questions for Madam Secretary if I may ask the first one? Second panelist is uh, Dr. Hart Yula Danira. <laughs> Am I right? Right. <laughs> so he is the country director of uh, FAT India. So he is a expert, especially he is in the field of investment and finance. He is into agriculture and rural development and natural resource management, agri business and etc. etc. So presently he is serving as the country director and representative for to the Republic of India. And earlier he was serving as a country director in Eritrea and Ethiopia and South Sudan and representative to African Union from 2015 to 2021. Sorry. And also managed the country's program in Equatorial Guinea and Chad from 2006 to 2007. He was in Guinea again for 2008 and 2009 and Ghana in 2010 to 2015. So over 20 years of experience in leading programs relating to food security, agriculture, rural development, natural resource management, and agri business. Uh, his qualification, of course, is a PhD in geography from Heidelberg University, and also a MS geography from the same university. So uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Hunt. He will share with us the IFS learning from Megales in farmers' collectivization and value chain development. Thank you so much, and yeah, well, uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I would like to really thank uh, the government of Megalia to uh, for organizing this uh, session, and I'm feeling very much honored to speak here. I think it's it's uh, so laudable to uh, do good work, but then also to share the lessons because nowadays, you know, it's it's not only about the money that we invest. There's so much money around when you 
uh, for investment, uh, and especially India is investing a lot, but investing it well, right? Like and, and really transforming the investments into real impact on the ground. I think this is uh, this is the real wealth, and uh, so I really um, commend the government for for organizing this session and sharing it with the rest of the world. Um, IFAD, of course, is very proud to be associated with your work. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's work that is very much spot on with our mandate, which is uh, really um, investing in rural people so that they can overcome their uh, you know, poverty and their vulnerability to um, long-term negative trends and to the challenges of climate change and everything. So, so really um, targeted on, on the most vulnerable, the most remote the people in the very, very remote locations uh, that's our mandate, and uh, we are partnering very closely with the government of Megalia. But as a UN agency and an international finance institution, we are just really supporting this work. And uh, I want to really emphasize that this work is being done by the government and the partners uh, on the ground. So I can only give you some high-level ideas of what I think is important, but, uh, but really I think the, the real need is coming from the other uh, panelists. Um, <clears throat> From our side, really, some of the, the key challenges, and they have already been mentioned and enumerated, um, you know, part of it is really the small scale of the production. Right? Like these are producers that have very, very small holdings, and uh, obviously it's very difficult when you have a, when you are a small holder to really compete in markets and, and, and develop a big strength. So, um, Typically, these smallholders are trapped in a low productivity production system, very limited access to technologies, limited access to, to finance, and limited access to markets. And when you look at it, what is more important? What has to come first? We realize that they all have to come at the same time. Right? Um, you can't improve your productivity without finance uh, to invest in better productivity and better technologies. And these investments, you will not get finance without having a market. So, so it's a chicken and egg situation. We have to solve this at the same time. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and and what, what we've learned really over the over the past, I think, um, and I mean, India has done quite well with the Green Revolution, right? a very technology-based uh, intervention model. But but in the long run, with small holders. It is much more challenging than that, right? Like it's not just a technical solution. It's, we also have to look at the at the software of the system and how how, how the farmers relate to markets and relate to to, uh, to to other actors in the value chains. And so so this brings me to the first lesson. I've been asked to talk a little bit about the lessons from uh, from the work in Macalia. And the first lesson is really uh, I would like to highlight the importance of institutions. This investment in institutions that. Um, the, the lamp project is, is making. It's about uh, collectivization on the one hand, it's about aggregation, right? like we are aggregating and uh, enabling farmers, of course, to access larger markets or access markets at all. And uh, to do this in a very efficient way. So, so collectivization in an ideal uh, form brings about uh, a much greater, uh, much greater efficiency along the value chain. And efficiency means cost savings in the end, and that's, that's profit for, for the farmer. So that's, that's already one um, very direct uh, um, um, you know, benefit. But it is also really um, the whole institutional system, the software of the system that I've already talked about. It's like the operating system of a computer uh, that, that can be really driven by, by uh, investing in institutions. And another aspect that uh, has been mentioned maybe uh, indirectly when, when we refer to the middlemen is uh, the element of trust that is so important when we, when we look at businesses. Right? Like uh, when, you, when you do business in a trustful environment, uh, obviously the transaction costs go down because uh, we, we can um, um, do our business much more efficiently and, and this also leads to cost savings. That's been researched uh, for the last 50 years and uh, there, there are excellent studies on how much trust uh, is, is um, an important ingredient for, for doing a successful business. <clears throat> so the second, the second key lesson that I think uh, we have seen from Megaland is um, the, the focus on really markets and you know, demand, really market demand. And, uh, and enabling this demand-driven, market-based 
development. And uh, because very often we have seen in, in especially in publicly run projects that uh, you know they're supporting productivity increases, production increases, and then the farmers are sitting on their produce and don't know what to do with it. They can't eat it all by themselves, and uh, they also don't find the markets. But markets are not just like it's on the one hand the demand, but on the other hand, um, you know, we are often thinking of markets as a physical infrastructure or a road or, or all this, and all this matters. But really, what matters most is the productivity, right? Like the farmers, every farmer competes with any other farmer in in the world in a way, and we have to help the farmers to produce cheaper and competitively in these markets. Because if you're cheap, cheaper than your competitor, then you will have a market, and obviously. Transportation cost and these things matter as well, but uh, but the key that we can really influence or the farmers can really influence is uh, is uh, the productivity. So so it is about making business plans with the farmers that highlight how these investments in productivity are translating into returns, right? Like and uh, how they become profitable for the farmers. I think that is key, and this is I think where the lamp is doing. A uh, um, pretty good job. So, um, working with these producer groups to make better choices in the end, that's, that's what it comes down to. And uh, what we've learned is, on the one hand, this importance on market intelligence, really studying the markets, not assuming that there is a market, but really knowing and studying and making sure that the markets are real. And uh, the other one, the other lesson I think that, that we are learning is that obviously the, the, the capacity of the producer groups and their members matters a lot. Right? Like some are more entrepreneurial and others are a little bit less. And um, so, so it's, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution that we can hope will deliver everywhere the same results. But we have to work with the, with the people on the ground to, um, to support them as their case. <coughs> so last, lastly, the third lesson that I would like to share is, of course, uh, the one and uh, you've already heard about it: the scaling. Right? Like, uh, you know, to be successful in value chains requires scale, uh, and um, typically the larger markets um, become interested when there is a larger amount, obviously, involved, and so on. And that's again the story of efficiency to some some extent. So I think it's, it's been quite successful in Mechelland, the, the multi-tiered approach. Right? The, we've seen the collection centers um, at, the, at the grassroots that ensure good aggregation, proper handling, uh, hygiene, and so on, and also uh, good storage, um, efficiency in transportation. But then at the district level, the investment now in these um, uh, prime hubs um, is particularly interesting because it will add new opportunities for processing, for value addition, reaching new markets, and then of course uh, bring bring the, the, the produce to another level. So, so this is um, making it, um, making of course the market pool much stronger if you have this clustered approach and, um, and uh, somehow feeding into something bigger. Um, I think I would like to see this infrastructure development as very effective, especially if it is combined with the right institutional development. Right? Because very often we see also infrastructure that are somehow sunk investments when the institutional development is not playing along or when it doesn't really coincide with the, the marketing strategy. So, so sinking all these, I think, is, a, is really the strategic um, um, gain that, that a project like this can bring about. So now I've talked about three lessons, and all of them have been quite positive. I think behind this, of course, is a lot of trial and error, and I would like to commend really the team for, for being critical and uh, you know taking sometimes the risks. Sometimes I'm, I'm sure we have burnt our fingers and done something, uh, learned some tough lessons. I think it's part of the process. Right? Like, uh, we have to embrace also this, this tough learning and, uh, and really um, develop the evidence uh, so that we can inform our way forward and finally produce something uh, successful. I hope that IFAD will remain um, you know, engaged in the long-term journey of this learning, I think, um, and, um, and we'll, we'll be very, very happy, happy to do so. Maybe the last lesson, and that's a bigger lesson, is really, you know, when, when I talk to people who are not in the agricultural sector, not in my, my line of the trade, or in our line of the trade, there's always a strong sentiment of doubt 
whether you know smallholders can become actually viable and whether smallholder agriculture is something that can be viable. And I think uh, with this uh, story in, in Mekale, we, we are showing very clearly that it is possible. Right? Like with the right support, with the right policy environment, with the right uh, support that, that uh, invests in their entrepreneurial capacity rather than uh, dashing out charity, that people can become empowered, that their institutions can become empowered and really overcome poverty and uh, achieve uh, a much higher level of resilience. So with this, I would like to end my little expose and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Um, in fact, they were very insightful. So now next, uh, our third panelist is Sri Augustus Shampang Suting. He's a deputy project director, Megale Based Management Agency. We'll discuss the initiatives undertaken for building agri value chains by Meghalaya Based Management Agency. For the lesser aware, MBAB is a, a not for profit company incorporated under the planning department of the government of Meghalaya, engaged in the implementation of specialized development projects focused on enhancement of nat natural resource management, access to finance livelihood development, enterprise promotion, market linkage, and knowledge services. MBA is implementing the IFED supported mega land project in Megalia. So a short introductory word by Suting. Uh, he's got about 56 years of experience. His core expertise is in social mobilization and convergence and market linkages. He's retired as a project director of SNT Cell. Planning Department, Governor Megalia, and as an officer on special duty for State Council of, for Science, Technology, and Environment, Bio Research Development Center, and Science Science Center. Sorry, uh, he's a B mechanical. So, sir, over to you. And good evening, everyone. And Madam Shawanda. Dr. Ulas, my colleague, uh, Father Sony, our minister, community. It gives me immense pleasure to be here today to share the roadmap of what social mobilization is all about. And Megalia, they say, it's a saying that says, small is beautiful. And that's what Megalia is. Though the state is small, but the people have big heart and the social cohesiveness is one strength that we have never used for economic reasons. And that's the USP that we need. High value, low value for us. We cannot compete with Karnataka, Andhra, Haryana, Punjab, but definitely when it comes to high value, low value, we can compete with the rest of the world. And I've been working with the EFA funded project for three decades. I've seen the three generations of if I have the project, and I would like to share this little bit to so dwell outside the overview of this, but it's a learning that we need to understand the foundation before we build our houses of remote villages and value chain. In the first project of IFAD, we dwell more on the natural resource management and the NAMG. The, the exit of the project led to the formation of the BEC and the NREGS implementation in the state of Malaria. The second generation project for which I worked for was the livelihood and the livelihood improvement project for the Himalayas. There we were concentrating mostly on self-help group movement, looking at women empowerment and creating an enabling environment for groups, especially women to grow. Based on the learning of that came the uh, NRLM project the SNG movement, and one of the, when we closed that project, I remember Kong Trinity before she got the Padma Sri Award, the impact of the project, what, what she told us was, the project taught us the concept of savings and how to keep books in the court. And that's the institution that the previous project left. But in those two projects, we built institution and we focused more on natural resource management. Then we realized that sustainability can only happen if we look at access and livelihood and access to market. And that's the third generation project. And as 
Dr. Gurudev said, I hope this project ends next year, but I hope the partnership with IPAD continues because the institutional knowledge that we gain is more important than the money that we get because that is the legacy of sustainability that we need. The community mobilization, the, the concept of aggregation is all a learning. In the previous project, we had because of the remote, because IPAD worked, Propo work for the remotest village. We could not get the people to come into a central place. So we had to start looking at clustering of these villages. And that's where, from the cell health group, we created an innovation cluster, cluster level federation, which today in NRLM we call it the village organization and the CLM. So when we learn in this project, we realize that we have a lot of strength. Though Meghalaya, and Nagaland is really, it's a hill. We are mountain people. We have mountain problems as such, be it in topography, be it in density of population. In Nagaland and Meghalaya, the area is the same. The number of households is the same. But we have 6,800 villages. They have only 1,200 villages. And how do you bring in that economies of scale when your villages are so fragmented, land is so fragmented? You need to work of thing outside the box and you need to look at your strength and the strength that we have i won't go into all the details that the agroclimatic zones the organic by tradition but i will stick to the high highly educated youth but unemployed i see the strength in unemployment because when you're unemployed you start thinking outside the box and then you start looking at you know how i would be able to make a little out of this and that's the strength that we need to tap in the young, vibrant Megalians. And these are the people who have seen the world. But being out, now we want it to be a brain game, not a brain drain. COVID was the culprit of it, but today they're here, and I see a lot of entrepreneurs who are from the village, who have been out, who came back. And this will lead to the upscaling of the, of the intervention that we're looking at, at the, and the USP of high value, low volume product. Well, the strong cohesiveness of the community, the clan, the Mahari, the Kur, the Ka, the Darbar, we have not tapped in this institution. The cell health group that department have done, the FPCs, all these need to converge together, to unite together, to forget the differences that they have, the department that they have, they work. Because the goal is doubling farmers' income. And that can be done only if we all work together. And on that essence, and we have to look at the weakness as well. The weakness is we set up infrastructure not knowing where it should be. We have community halls that we go only once in the month, maybe, because they were not strategically placed for it to be used as a collection center. And that's where we need to focus on. We, are, we transport facilities. We need to look at what has been <coughs> happening. Build on it. Half the vehicle contains human, half contains agricultural produce. Can we build it up on this strength that we have? Rather than saying, no, it should carry only agricultural produce and come back empty handed. So this needs, the strength that we have needs to be built in. And inadequate technology infusion. We have a lot of machineries <coughs> all over India, but they talk in tons per hour. We need to downscale technologies to kgs per hour and that's the way that we need to be because as is a small uh, small production fragmented land very low productivity but then again we look at infrastructure no electricity no water no place to have big enough to hold 200 300 metric tons of material so these are the things that we need to work together and very we with market linkages in the sense that our farmers knows about a guy who comes in to aggregate at his village or the nearest weekly hut. Beyond that, he has no market <coughs> intentions of the rest of the world. And that's something that we all need to work on to arrive at a pro poor sustainable interventions. And too much dependency on grants and subsidy is also killing us. Because our vision then is it's only to reach that much of subsidy and grant which actually should be a bonus for doing the hard work. 
And the last point is the lack of entrepreneurial skills here. This is something, though we have the social cohesiveness, but the strength of being an entrepreneur, first generation entrepreneur, a lot of capacity building is coming. And I'm very happy that when we partner with the IFAD for the first externally aided project, today we have a JICA coming in, today we have KFW coming in, we have four or five externally aided projects to come. But the roadmap was shown to the small intervention that IFAD was there as a partner for more than three decades with us. Well, when you look at NRLM, it focuses on women as it is only. You look at FPCs, it focuses more on organic. You look at household, we need to mobilize them to be part of the SAG movement, to be part of the activity group, the JLGs, but to be part of the producer group, but at the end, they must be legally formalized in form of FPCs or the integrated village cooperative societies. And most important, we need to do the clustering. We have done the clustering across the state now. And the clustering is done in such a way that we take only three income generating activities. as the first focus of each of these FPCs or IDCS. Because if we have, if you look at the SAG, the weakness that they have, is one SAG member wants to do bakery, another wants to do tailoring, another person wants to do embroidery. You don't get the economies of scale. But if you look at the SAG, upgrade them to, to a producer group. And then this producer group, all of them coming together to formalize into a FPC or an IDCS and have different divisions. The piggery division, the poultry division, and the, the spice division. That's what the integrated village cooperative society is doing to the IFAD funded project, which is called in the component of inclusive supply chain and enterprise development. The learning of this project, the, the teaching of this project, the tinkering of this project has led to the state taking it to upscale. We have 330 cooperative IDCS. We have around 12 to 20 FPC is working, but this needs to go across the state so that we have the economies of scale. Well, apart from all this that we are doing, the most important is how does this product from the chicken leg goes into the rest of the country. And that is how price discovery can be done. We cannot leave it at the mercy of the, of the, of the farmers or the collective. We did through the project trial marketing where we try to connect with other parts, other producers, or the need of the, the partnership with private limiteds, with uh, other public sectors, to take the produce to there, to Mumbai, to Delhi, to Calcutta, to Dubai, to see our produce. We did this just one year, and we have been able to do not less than 300 metric tons to the IFAD funded project. More than three crores we are able to give to the farmers and based on this learning, we are able to get a price discovery of what is the logistic problem that we face if you take it to Calcutta, if you take it to Bangalore. And this is knowledge that stays with the community. Because when we send the material to Bangalore, we send them in the same truck with the material. So that is aware of what are the logistic problems that we face when we take things down south. Or when it comes to a Zarpur market. What are the things that because as what the previous speaker said, trust building. Trust building exercise is what is required. And trust can only happen if they go through that whole value chain process. Otherwise, if we have just sent the truck, they will say, maybe the project has taken some commission in the, in the middle. But by sitting, sitting on the truck itself and going through this whole channel, they realize the differences and the problems that they face across. So we did a learning across the state this time. And based on this, we are able to come up with a few of the uh, investors, the partnership with ITU Private Limited from Bangalore to do pineapple. We did, Desai Farms has come up to look at giving us the Mauritius variety of pineapple that we can start planting at. Then we are looking at Technochemical Private Limited. They have the technology of biocurcumin. How to extract biocurcumin, how to market it. And they hear us our partners for intervention in the Rathan <coughs> mission. And we're working with, with uh, the Rathan Spices, where they are the main dealers for Everest and everyday uh, spices. So these are the kind of partnerships that we need to work in. 
And this can only grow if these august people that are here today come in to assist, to help us. Not only us, by helping Meghalaya, we are not only helping Meghalaya, we are helping India grow as a resilient uh, country in the world with peace. Thank you. BMA has made in the rural communities. So we now we move on to our next uh, panelist, Padma Shri Trinity Sayo, an agri entrepreneur who will discuss the efforts towards mobilizing community for collective marketing of Lakadong turmeric, one of our state's most prized spice. So uh, just a brief introduction about on Trinity Sayo. She's an agri entrepreneur. She's a proprietor of Daya Processing Unit in Meghalaya. She's a secretary of Yang Chem Spice Producer Industrial Cooperative Society, West Angeles District, Meghalaya. She's got about 20 plus years of experience. Her core expertise is in the organic farming and uh, community mobilization as a lead farmer and also as an agri entrepreneurship. Her career highlights is a teacher in the lower primary school. Her uh, awards and recognition is that she's, she got an excellence in horticulture in 2018, awarded by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers' Welfare, Government of India, on the occasion of Women's Farmers' Day. Padma Shri in 2020, awarded by the Honorable President of India for invaluable contribution towards promoting cultivation of Lakadam turmeric in Nicaragua. And also the Governor's Award for Excellence in Public Service in 2022, awarded by the Governor of Meghalaya for developing rural women of own sustainable organic farming to grow the Lakadong variety of turmeric. She is a Bachelor of Arts. So over to you, Kong. Thank you, sir. And. Uh, Dr. Hesavanda, Sasu Tings uh, from my part, father, and uh, the other one, Every good afternoon to one and all. My name is Trinity Sayo. I'm a farmer and entrepreneur from the state of Mekalaya. I was born in a small village called Muli in Western Hills district of Mekalaya. In the year 1995, I started teaching at a local primary school, and after school hour, I used to work in the field. After a long break, I was able to study again and complete my graduation with a bachelor's degree in arts. Lagadang turmeric was not popular in the early years. Even yet, if it is still only there many in a thousand, in a hundred years ago. Another variety called a kitchen was widely grown, especially in my own village, Mule village. Due to, due to poor awareness, turmeric farmer were this platform, I take this opportunity to share my message as words of encouragement for the young and upcoming farmers and entrepreneurs and request the government and stakeholder here to help a farmer in Mekalaya with any kind of assistance possible that will encourage them to practice sustainable agriculture and sustainable incomes. Agriculture being the backbone of the Indian economy, especially the Northeast region, which is largely dependent on agriculture for livelihood, it is important to note that the upcoming generation are losing interest in agriculture. I speak this with my experience and therefore request everyone present to build way and opportunities for our next generation so that agriculture and our volleyball agro products will continue to sustain in the day to come. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we continue to take pride in your Padma Shri and even that put focus into our much deserved record of turmeric. 
So now we move on to our fifth panelist, it's Dr. Sunny Joseph Mabel, the Secretary of All Garo Hills Multipurpose Corporate Society Limited, who will discuss the efforts towards mobilizing community and setting up infrastructure in remote geographies from a cooperative society perspective. Just a short introductory about Dr. Sunny. Uh, he's got about 30 years of experience. His core expertise is on community mobilization into local agroeconomic context, community health, behavioral of tribal communities in Meghalaya. Uh, he's, got, he's won several awards as a district level award for promotion of environment, state level award for social welfare, and a World Malali Award in 2017. Uh, his qualifications is MA in History, Master's in Social Work, Postgraduate in Diploma in HR, Master in Philosophy, and PhD in Rural Development. So over to you. Good evening, everyone personally here. Madam Secretary, Agriculture Government of Meharia. Dr. Han, Sir Augustus, and other panelists and friends. All that I want to share has already been mentioned in the course of uh, speeches and messages and experiences shared. While I was coming to participate in this program, I saw a caption, no defect, no effect. You know? It caught my eye and because I am a living example of that. This year I aggregated about uh, 2.210 metric tons of cashew nut with the hope of selling it in time, paying a very good price for farmers because farmers were never getting a good price for cashew nut. They were getting about 40, 50 at the max. This year we offered a price of 90 rupees by the time it came to our Go down warehouse, it was about 95 rupees. And today, dairy sell set to sell their cash for 80 rupees. But in the history of Meghalaya, uh, I think in the, our region especially, there has no uh, cash note has not been aggregated to this quantity at any time. And uh, so, this is the uh, thankful to the support of the government of Meghalaya. The program is succeeding, but I have failed. I would say I have failed. And not only in this, in many other fields we are still experimenting. My dear friends, um, I don't think I need to go through this uh, presentation because everything has been said, really. The, the combined effort of government of Meharia, IFAD, and the community stakeholders, we have come a long way in addressing the challenges. And I think the struggle right now, the challenge that right now we experience is how to institutionalize this. I think Mr. Han, Dr. Han mentioned about this. How to institutionalize, institutionalize this. According to my learning, my insight, two things are critical. One is human resource development, integrating human resource development. Second is technology. If these two are very well integrated into the communities, the access to the market is happening, the community level uh, aggregation is already taking place, infrastructure is being created, the, all this will lead to the end effect which is the well-being of the farmers. The pilot and the focus on which I based my work for the last 37 years in Meharia, everyone asked me, where are you from? Everybody asked me, I am a bit confused, you know. I am a bit confused because I am a Keralaite by birth, but I lived there 13 and a half years and the remaining 37 years I have lived in Meharia. So, uh, can, you, can, you, can you speak your native language? Yes, I, I studied my native language till class 10, my articulation, but post then I speak my the tribal language more, far more fluently than my, uh, my native language. So, I, I always face an identity crisis. Even today, so someone asked me, where are you from? Where am I from? So, so the, the, the ecosystem is set for us to go forward. I think government has done a marvelous job and I should commend the government and government officers and the entire team 
in making this happen. And I think the 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 access will uh, the access to the markets and the processing will is the is near is is near uh, near achievement status, and we will surely be there. In this, in this, I want to share one more important learning which has not been shared. I have been listening to the conversations here. Meghalaya farmers, particularly in my region, I cover around five districts. I have 30 primary cooperatives uh, along with me. Uh, is this that we have never had quality inputs, scientifically tested quality inputs uh, planted in our region. So although there has been as diverse pro products, agricultural products and all that. It's because the farmers were not scientifically educated as to which are the crops that will uh, provide them high value at the same time uh, and therefore they need to plant that more. <laughs> Whatever had market value, farmers planted. So this has to change. So we pass a cooperative uh, among all of the 7,000 farmers that is in our network. We are now focusing on spices and fruits, spices and fruits, because I believe uh, farmers' welfare and sustainability of environment, the, the points mentioned in the SDGs, are very uh, deeply interconnected, deeply interconnected. Um, so we hope we can reach, be there, we can be there, we will be there soon. I am very hopeful of this because of what has happened, although as I said, I have failed as a person, as an entity, in the program is succeeding because through defects we are learning. We were never in the business, but we are in the business now, and I think I am sure we will succeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mehru. Those were indeed very interesting points. And uh, we are going to move on to our final panelist for the day is Sri Revista Harablu. He's a Chief Executive Officer of East Delivery Hoya Organic FPC, who will discuss the challenges and lessons of managing an FPO in remote geographies. A uh, short introduction about uh, Revista Harablu. He's a CEO of East Delivery FPC. Uh, he's got about six years of experience, and his core expertise is on decision making transformational leadership, growth mindset, and assertive communication. Basically, he's a social worker and also a farmer's innovator, motivator, sorry, and has won the National Award for Valuable Contribution for Excellence in Horticulture. And his uh, educational qualification is as a Master of Science in Biotechnology. So, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Good evening, respected Madam Isawanda Lalu, Secretary, Agriculture Government of Meghalaya, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today I stand before you to share the remarkable journey of Eastern Ribhoi Organic Pharma Producer Company Limited a testament of power of collective efforts <coughs> and incredible potential of our farming community. I come from a picturesque village of Umtum, Ribhoi District, Meghalaya. I'm honored to be here today representing the 500 dedicated farmers from nine villages who came together in 2017 to form our FPC. You see, Agriculture is not just a livelihood, it's deeply ingrained in our heritage. Both my parents hail from agriculture background and their legacy has been our guiding force in our lives. When we embark on this journey, we face numerous challenges. The most significant among them was the need for unity. Bringing together 500 individuals with unique, unique perspective and method was no small feat. 
but through perseverance and shared purposes, we overcame this hurdle and the Eastern Rikhoi FPC was born. Ginger and turmeric emerge as our flagship crops and we focus our efforts on their cultivation. Each farmer contributed 500 rupees annually as share capital, which initially fueled our operation. We diligently issued share certificates, maintained detailed farming diaries, and closely monitored the production process among our farmers. One of our key innovation was streamlining the marketing process. We recognized that we direct, by directly purchasing and processing the produce, we could secure better returns. We ventured into online marketing through different platforms like IndioMark and other platforms. We also established WhatsApp group to connect with buyers in Shillong and beyond. During the unprecedented challenges posed by 2020 lockdown, we adapted swiftly. We continued to correspond <coughs> our operation by purchasing and delivering agricultural produce to directly to retail shops, which benefit both farmers and consumers. Today, the FPC stands among managed by 11 dedicated board members. Our team includes a correspondingly chartered accountant, a CEO, accountant, office staff, 20 daily laborers working in our processing unit, and our annual turnover, a testament to our growth, has risen from 70 lakh in 2021-22 to 1.3 crore in 2022-23. Our success story is intertwined with the invaluable support we receive from the schemes of the central and the state government. The Mission Organic Value Chain Development for Northeastern Region has been instrumental, providing assistance for production, organic certification, and establish of crucial infrastructures like collection centers, processing unit, cold storage, and we have now the organic outlet. Working capital support and training support that we have received from the state government has continually empowered our farmers and board of members and have been by vital in our progress. So why organic cultivation? It's not just a choice. Is the responsibility that we hold dear. Organic farming addresses the health concern of consumers, ensuring they have safe, chemical-free produce. It nurtures a clean environment, promotes soil health, and enables the sustainable production of high-quality goods. And let's not forget the better price that we fetch in the market. Our region, approximately 70% of agricultural practices are organic. organic. It's a heritage that we are proud to uphold, and through our FPC, we are ensuring that these practices continue to thrive. In conclusion, I stand here today as a testament to what collective efforts, determination, and support from the government can achieve. Our journey is far from over, but with the continued support of the organization like us, us and the relentless spirit of our farmers, I am confident that we will leave a lasting impact in our community and the agricultural landscape. Thank you. Kubishman. Uh, thank you, sir, for those points. That is very relevant indeed to in the context of our topic of discussion. So now the floor is open for questions. 
So we request the audience, if you have any questions against mentors or panelists, please come forward and we can share the some answers. We'll be able to provide any time. So how is this, so completely understandably, because of the initial teething troubles, you would want government to play a very strong role. How do you guys see this going forward? What is the space for entrepreneurs? Can that space be created? Or are the scales just too small for entrepreneurs to you know, really enter the space and generate additional value? Will the space be limited to more of a development intervention? Do you see it becoming more commercially viable so that other players can get involved? Although the government, <laughs> over is, I think no, I the government has left sufficient freedom to the community institutions to find their access to uh, markets and credit for both. both. Uh, however, since farmers, uh, this is the first time sort of uh, uh, access. Farmers are struggling, or institutions like ours are struggling to find a bigger market outside to which we can uh, sell aggregated product as well as processed product. So over there, government is facilitating, but uh, facilitating our active participation so that it becomes easy for the entrepreneurs and for, un for institutions to move on their own some time from now, say five years from now. I imagine for myself, for example, Right now, we are dependent on the government, right now. But I imagine that if I reach down the line, I don't want to depend on any government. I'm very clear of, as far as I'm concerned, and my corporate is concerned. Thank you. Just to add to what Father Sami had said, you know, we are very cognizant of the fact that the government has to play the role of facilitator, now and in the long run. So, because of the various issues we've talked about, you know, we have had to step in where you know, working capital is not available to the farmers, uh, banks are not willing to lend loans, to give loans to the farmers, and hence we have to come up with schemes of instruments where, it's, when, where they do, they get zero interest loans, or you know, uh, working capital is made available to them in the form of grants. But you know, how the question that you asked is very relevant, because how long can we keep doing this? So we, you know, in this generation, this is what we want to do. We create this, uh, this, you know, this uh, <coughs> group of young, driven people who understand and realize the way forward is through agriculture uh, because of the huge numbers of people who are dependent on it. Our minister, you know, from time to time has kept, has kept uh, you know, talking about the fact that we want to bring people back to the field. There's a huge exodus happening from people from the rural areas coming into the urban centers, you know, looking for education, seeking jobs, where, where, whereas jobs are getting saturated. There is a, a mindset that you know only government jobs are secure or reliable. When you speak to a lot of the entrepreneurs in this room, they have shown through practice and through experience that this is not so. And uh, in terms of promotion and you know, assistance to entrepreneurs, the government has also come up with a program called Prime promotion and incubation of market-driven enterprises because we want to create this setup where we help to nurture, to incubate, to handhold, and to provide the right connections to budding entrepreneurs. So all of this is being done, keeping in mind the fact that we have all these issues because of low literacy rates, because of poor access to information. You know, government has to act as a facilitator. But at the end of the day, the, you know, the, the vision that we have is that people will step out, they will stand on their own two feet, 
Mache Dr. Amrit for instance of become self-sustaining and you know we can go on to do other things and help other sectors or groups. So that is from my side, but I think uh, it's just a fun thing. So if I may just say from different side, first of all, I really appreciate your contribution. I think it is very, very relevant and an excellent question and, uh, and you know, hints of the discussion where it, where it needs to go. And I think we, we get very, very good answers from this. From Ipad's side, <coughs> I have um, experience in several other countries also. I, it's happening all the time, right? Like you're, you're standing in a farm and the farmers say, oh, the little men, you know, they are the evil. And then I sometimes respond to the farmers, so why don't you sell it yourself? Then you, go, oh, but you know, I don't have the capacity and this and that. The middlemen also do a lot of services to the value chain. Right? In many places, they make the value chain work. They're taking a lot of risks, they borrow uh, to, to, buy, to pay directly at the farm gate. So they also have their cost. And I think a lot of it is um, making, making this transparent. All right. so, so what we've done in other countries was an open book system where we said, okay, we facilitate, you know, we did this job uh, with the to facilitate so that really the farmers understood why uh, a kilo of rice cost uh, 10 times as much in the, in the city than uh, at the farm rate and so on. So this helped to build the trust actually and then to really uh, develop long-term collaboration. Here now in India, we are working mainly with the government, or most investing goes to the government, but we have also um, mobilized uh, Relatively, in the context of India, it's quite a small amount, but uh, an amount of uh, grant funds to, to invest directly in entrepreneurs who can link up to farmers and to do this work. To basically pilot it so that we get some of these models going. And uh, this in collaboration with projects like the Mega Lab. So that we develop these models, we can learn from them, we can see what works. And, uh, and then uh, basically <coughs> replicate it or, or increase it, these investments. <coughs> so, so there's a, a specific intention really to, to explore further and widen the space also of knowledge and so on to see what works here in India. Thank you.